listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the House by the Viewsore podcast. I'm your host, William, and join me today will be Sean. Hello. And on this episode, we'll be discussing the 1995 film from David Fincher 7, which is a movie that I'm sure everybody has at least seen some elements from that at this point. Or have you heard of the number? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does come after six. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of it. It's uh, it's a number that's not divisible by anything else. Uh, it's a prime number. It's, but the title is very much like a lot of sequels from the 2000s where they, they fit the number in. Normally they yeah. reserve those for sequels, but this is the rare occurrence where the first film in this series has a number as a letter. Yeah, well, it's one of those things where it's a movie that is very stylistic and... And two, like, so when you're in, if you're in the filmmaking side, like, you're aware of what LUTs are. So they're just, um, it's like a lookup table that looks up colors and things, and you apply it to footage, and it gives you a predetermined look. There's a bunch of seven LUTs out there because everybody's trying to go mm-hmm. for that specific look that mm-hmm. they had, um, like the color palette and all that, because it was a very specific look at the time, and people would try to go for that type of thing now. It's a grimy film. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Kevin Spacey, before Kevin Spacey had all the controversy in recent years. But it's a role that those recent controversies don't make that role any less creepy. Like way more creepy and harder yeah. to watch. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so before we get to discussing... Shoot him! <laughs> yeah, before we get to seven, we'll go through some recent things we've been watching to possibly recommend. And... Um, so I watched the movie just last night. Have you seen Wind River? Yeah, I watched it when it came out on Blu-ray. I don't know. Okay. Was, was that this past year or was it the year before? Uh, it was this past year. Okay, yeah. I watched it when it rented it from Redbox or whatever. Okay, because it's on Netflix now. Oh, okay. And I watched it last night with Julie. And that is from Taylor Sheridan, who was also the director of, um, what was it, Hell or High Water? Mm-hmm. And was the writer of Sicario. So a pretty good, you know, one, two, three punch there, you know, writing Sicario, directing Hell or High Water, and then following up with this. And it's got um, Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen in it. So it's a Marvel reunion. And um, it's essentially about a young woman dies on a a native reservation in Wyoming. And Elizabeth Olsen is the FBI agent assigned to investigate. And Jeremy Renner is a local... um, uh, wildlife hunting and wildlife services yeah. uh, who happens to be in the area tracking down like a mountain lion that has been killing livestock and he helps with the investigation because he's familiar with the train and, he found the and body, tracking right? he's the one who found the body yeah. so that's the basic setup and then it does go some into the politics a little bit of like how on an Indian reservation how the law enforcement works and how jurisdiction works and how things like that are and how those a lot of those places in today's world are very depressing downbeat places where there's like high drug usage and and like you know they're not protected by the same rights as sometimes a normal citizen is you know what I mean like the the women can essentially it's like there's not the same missing person statistics yeah. kept for yeah. those reservations as there are for the general population yeah, at it's, large. There's, it's a way easier to maybe get away with something. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And especially in somewhere that's like such a, yeah. like a winter wasteland. Yeah. So it's a movie like that. And then it has, you know, some other performances in it, it has, I won't spoil who all's in it. Cause some of this stuff kind of gets revealed throughout, mm-hmm. but overall the movie, um, great performances. I thought it was a great follow up to hell or high water. And just, you know, because both movies thematically kind of deal with, like, downtrodden areas and people who aren't doing so great, mm-hmm. um, you know, societally, and what, like, a certain situation that arises, like, how that affects people. So, you know, this movie, I think, is a little bit headier um, material than Hell or High Water, because that and one was, less less, maybe less genre. I mean, it, it does feel like, at some points of Wind River, it does feel like... Okay, this feels like a movie version of a TV procedural. 
yeah. you know, towards maybe the middle well, of it, you feel like you're getting into that loop. Well, like a, a more straightforward version. So like Twin Peaks kind of starts out with investigation into the death of yeah. a young girl. The show The Killing is kind of the same way. So there's different shows and movies that start off similar. But then this one, you know, mostly takes place in snowy locations, outdoors, and, you know, just, you know, investigates character relationships. And, and the thing I liked about it was it didn't delve into very stereotypical things that happen in these movies. Um, cause like without spoiling what it is, just like character interactions went in a way that to me was more like the characters had respect for each other and, and operated in a way that didn't just fall into the same tropes as every other type mm-hmm. of movie like this with things. So I was, I was pleased by that. And the overall story, like as it unfolds was good. Um, at least the performances are good. So I enjoyed the movie a lot. I think the third really act good. is really, really good. Yeah. Like parts of the movie I, I was enjoying, but you know, you're like, okay, I'm waiting to see where this is going. I, like you want to see resolution because it is somewhat a mystery. Like yeah. you're trying to figure things out. But like once that third act hits, it's yeah. like, bam, it once, hits, man. Once you get the situation and the stakes laid out, yeah. then you're just kind of concerned for what's going to happen. Yeah, it's very good. And then, you know, the movie, you know, the, all the notes it ends on, it has, you know, thematic resonance. Like once it ends, mm-hmm. it does have a point. So I just enjoyed that movie a lot. I thought it's something you should definitely check out on Netflix. The, the ending felt like the end of Metal Gear Solid on PlayStation. <laughs> when you're like, oh, I'm cool playing the spy game. And then all of a sudden it starts hitting you with some stuff. You're like, yeah. oh, wait, this is telling me some stuff that is messed up. And yeah. I should, you know. Now I know this. I have to think about this stuff. Yeah. So the movie, like, which is good. It's a great way to end it. You know. Yeah, because it has some thrills in it, mm-hmm. but it's um trying to think of comparisons. Like it's less like a Tarantino film and more like No Country for Old Men or something. Yeah. Not saying it's super similar to that. It's just there are moments of thrilling uh, things occurring, but there's more dramatic heft and weight to mm-hmm. it. And yeah, and it's just a movie that. Um, the only thing is, like, after I watched it, there was a couple of things. I'm like, was that a plot hole or was that just something that the way it played out? But overall, I thought it was a really good movie. And I'm excited to see what Taylor Sheridan does in upcoming projects. And, you know, great performances from Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth mm-hmm. Olsen. And, you know, all the different actors that fill out the kind of smaller roles in the movie were good, too. So something I definitely recommend checking out. It's not really horror or anything. And it's not even that genre. Um it was just what I thought was a really good movie. And mm-hmm. it was something last year that I think part of it was it was initially purchased by the Weinstein company. And then once all of that came out, then they allowed it to get dumped and sold to someone else. So it could get released without being held up in that controversy. And then it got a smaller release and it got some awards buzz and got, you know, some talk about nominations and things, but it didn't really have a huge impact. I mean, it made some money back. I think it made its budget back and made enough to be profitable. And then it's on video now, but it's one of those movies I think that will grow via streaming audiences just because all the kind of things around its release. I think if that stuff hadn't happened with the wine scenes or if a different company had purchased it, then it would have had a larger release over time. But yeah, it's something I really enjoy and I'd recommend checking out. Um, and then something else I watched quickly was Santa Clarita Diet Season 2. So that is the r- zombie kind of sitcom show that's on Netflix. It's got Drew Barrymore and Timothy Oliphant who apparently both on some recent interview show mentioned how they were both in Scream films because Drew Barrymore was in the opening of Scream 1 and Timothy Oliphant was in Scream 2. Hmm. So it's like, oh, I didn't really... Nope, they were both in those. Yeah. Uh, so that was an interesting connection. And the second season, I think, is way better than the first season because they just found more of like their beat and their kind of momentum. It's still one of those things where the comedy in it doesn't really connect to me. So it's one of those things where I just like is background noise or just throwing on to watch. Like I enjoyed it enough to continue watching it. Mm -hmm. And it's just the comedy to me didn't really connect in a big way. And like, so in addition to Drew Barrymore and Timothy Oliphant, you also have like, um, Nathan Fillion in it and, um, Joel McHale's in like an episode. So it has some people show up in it and there are some, you know, funny moments. I think I said the second season is better than season one. One and then they do and they do call out to like the the Reddit um uh subreddit parano- the paranormal subreddit so just like weird throw throw out things like that. <laughs> apparently got people like a lot of people got excited about it. like oh yeah man we're getting called out. <laughs> but it's it's not a show that's like digging deep into mythology and and all that it's not um the why of all of it is kind of there but it's not really the focus yeah. of something like 
an Ash versus it's Evil a situation Dad or, set up for a sitcom, basically, right? Yeah, so it's pretty much just like Drew Barrymore becomes like a living zombie. She eats something or does something. Something happens. For causes, some reason, I was thinking she was a vampire. <laughs> like, so, I mean, it plays out almost more like that because, yeah. like, something causes her to die and come back, and then she craves flesh, so she has to eat people. Because she looks like a normal person. She, she looks just, like a normal yeah. pe- person, and it's just she has to eat flesh. Yeah. And the show kind of just deals with how the family would deal with, like, oh, well, mom needs to eat people now. Because there's, like, one point, they're like, well, if we ever said we needed to just go and kill and eat people, like, who would be at the top of the list? And it's like, Nazis. And then we found some. <laughs> so there's like so it's moments. like Dexter? A little bit. I mean, I would say that the final season of Dexter does not end in a more ridiculous way than this show plays out. <laughs> but <laughs> overall, it's like a show that I know a lot of people are enjoying the comedy in it. Like I said, I found it to be an enjoyable enough show. And like the cast, like Timothy Oliphant's in a, operating in a in a better, like season one, I think he was kind of miscast a little bit, but I think they kind of worked it into his strength. So he's mm-hmm. uh, in the role a lot better in season two. So it's an enjoyable enough show. Nothing I think is must watch. Um, if you finish season one, you can check it out. If you got through season one and couldn't really finish and didn't like it, I think season two is a little bit better um, from what I watch. And, there, and it ends like there should be a season three, I think. And I would assume it will get renewed because it seems like a fairly popular show. But aside from like a little bit of the gore and some of the language that pops up occasionally, I don't see like that could have easily been a show on NBC or ABC. Mm-hmm. It would have probably needed to air in like the 10 o'clock block just because of the content matter. But it's a show that plays out more like a sitcom. And I, I, would, yeah. be, I would be interested to know if they tried to pitch it to networks before they brought it to Netflix. But it's an enjoyable enough show. Um, like I said, nothing that's must watch. Uh, it's, I guess, a good diversion from the kind of over um, serious zombie content like Fear the Walking Dead and Walking Dead and Z Nation, all that stuff. It's a little bit lighter content and it's quick episodes or like half hour episodes. So it moves along briskly. So it's not a ton of time that you have to invest into it. And it's something that paying attention, meticulous attention to each episode's story isn't necessarily required. Yeah. Um, so it's an enjoyable enough show. Like I said, nothing I would say you have to watch. But if you enjoyed season one, it was. I think it's an improvement. And if you didn't finish season one, but enjoyed some elements, it's an improvement that could be worth your time to check out. Yeah. My mom has been watching. She watches um, our daughter on Fridays at the house. And a lot of times I'm there editing. And this past Friday, she yeah. was asking me, she's like, have you watched the show Santa Clarita? It's really good. It's really funny. But also she was watching it while watching my daughter. So yeah. like, there were times where she wasn't even in front of the TV, like playing with my daughter, like over on the other side of the room, you yeah. know, but my mom was like able to, I guess, get enough enjoyment. out yeah. of it. So, it seems like it has a good, you know, I think the Drew Barrymore thing probably pulled in a lot of people Yeah, that maybe not would have not clicked on that on Netflix otherwise, which yeah, is if like you, a, if you good, didn't, a good casting choice. If probably. you didn't have someone that had a little bit of a following or fan base or awareness, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'd be interested to see how it works. But like the combination of those, like Drew Barrymore and then like the daughter character, like there's like, it's a good ensemble, um, like I said, the comedy is not really for me, but overall, like the show is still enjoyable enough, even if you're not sitting there laughing at it. Yeah. So but that was all the stuff I really had a chance to watch. Uh, I watched. Let's see here. Let me pull up my list. I've already forgotten what I watched. <laughs> um, I watched some more stuff on Filmstruck. Uh, originally, I'd watched like I had a four pack of Kurosawa Criterion when I was like probably either in high school. I think in high school, it was like Yoimbo, Sanjuro, uh, The Hidden Fortress, which is what everybody says, like Star Wars is kind of. Yeah, life, heavily would, influenced by yeah. me. And then uh, Seven Samurai. Loved all those films. Thought they were all phenomenal. Never got around to watching another Kurosawa film because also at the time, like, that thing was like $90, I think, that yeah. four-pack, and Criterions were like 30 to 40 bucks for a DVD. You know, and then all of a sudden, Blu-rays came out, and Criterion was a little late to get on Blu-rays, and yeah. I was like, eh. So I just, for some reason, never got around. I think I bought Ran, but the quality was not good on the DVD. Um, so I never, I was like, I'm going to wait till a good version of this comes out. So I watched Rashomon and Throne of Blood. Like those a lot, not as much as any of those other four films. Um, but, uh, but did enjoy them, uh, quite a bit. And I'm going to dig into some more of his stuff, his non, his non samurai or feudal Japan, uh, content soon, I think as well. Um, I watched, uh, Badlands, which is, uh, Terrence Malick. Yeah, I think that might have been his first film. I I know I was reading something like, "Hey, this you know kind of put him on the map at least." Yeah, um, that's from 1973, and Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. 
basic. Yeah. I never know how to say her name. Um, Warren Oates. Um, but I enjoyed that film quite a bit. It has a little bit of a Bonnie and Clyde vibe. Yeah. Um, Martin Sheen is, he's like probably 25 or 26 and she's like 16 or something, you know, yeah. he's like, I think it's supposed to be like 10 years older than her, but essentially some stuff happens and they run off together. And it's the part of the reason why I enjoy that film was in my mind, it puts me in a place of like kind of maybe where my great grandparents, like, I guess the feel of them when they were a little bit younger, like they were born in probably 19, I think 1918, yeah. 1916 or something. Um, so, uh, you know, it is set I, they in Texas at first, and then I think they start driving north. Um, but essentially, Martin Sheen is maybe, you know, robbing people or killing people to yeah. survive. But also he started this stuff. It's not like he was forced in any sort of position. Uh, it's about him making some bad decisions, maybe, and them on the run a little bit. But also, it's just kind of set out in the country, and they live in the woods for a while. Um, they visit a friend's house who has just, like, I think he was a guy who worked on a garbage route with Martin Sheen, and he just has all kinds of, like, for lack of a better word, junk he has collected, you know, yeah. that he just has, like, and it's just littered all around his pl- place. And, like, a lot of the building and set design, it feels like they just went to real places. Yeah. You know, just kind of in the country and stuff, and... My great grandpa, they weren't poor. You know, they had a house right there on Dixie Highway and stuff. Uh, and but he also would always go dumpster diving. You know, he lived through the Great Depression and yeah. stuff, and his garage was full of all kinds of stuff he found through found in a dumpster. Like he got my first skateboard, he found in the dumpster. My first Ninja Turtle, he found it and put a Tasmanian Devil head on it because it didn't have a <laughs> head. I think the first video game I had was a uh, Space Invaders knockoff you know like little yeah. handheld like he just had all kinds of stuff in his garage and this guy had the same thing so yeah. part of me like that appeal of like oh this is like very much reminds me of what i thought about like you know a lot of places were like yeah in the country prior to when i was born you know um uh but yeah it's 94 minutes not too long at all but i yeah. did i did enjoy that a lot I've, i think the only terrence malick film i've seen is tree of life yeah I believe. the brad pitt uh, yes have you seen any of his stuff uh through the overuse of all the tropes people pull from his work yeah. for short films we saw yeah. it that film of palooza thing i think i've no, like I've, I haven't watched anything of his. That's the thing. You're aware of his style. You know yeah. what I mean? Even like I only watched one of his films, but even before that, I was aware. Yeah. yeah. Like his style is heavily aped by pretentious filmmakers who are yeah. getting their start. I mean, he's very much somebody who goes at something from a more poetic angle rather than genre. Yeah. You know? This film is definitely more straightforward. It was his first film, as many people um, often start out maybe, you know, and they start exploring the art form. It's There's yeah. a divide between people who uh which i was watching that santa sagre documentary and jaradarsky or however you say his name Hodorowsky. he talked about you know making another film and he's like well i don't have anything to say right now like i'm not somebody who just i would go crazy i'm not somebody who makes a film to as a business to make money yeah. he's like i only make films when i have something to say right now i don't have anything to say i may have something to say at some point yeah but there very much is a divide between um people who want to tackle it as an art and kind of experiment with it and don't really care about, you know, they're not concerned with moving on up and getting a Marvel film or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and this film is more straightforward than tree of life. Absolutely. By like a hundred degrees. Yeah. Um, uh, so it is an easier watch. And sometimes some of those directors, it's, it's easier to start in on their er- earlier catalog and kind of grow with them. Yeah. Um, but, but I did like it quite a bit. Tree of life. I liked. Okay. But I was never going to revisit that film before I watched more of his work. Yeah. Because I was like, okay, I need to maybe get some perspective on his point of view yeah. first. Um, I like the film okay, but for people making fun of it, you know, it's like, okay, I, you didn't get, you didn't enjoy what he was doing, but I also don't fault you for being writing it off because if it's, it's an alienating film in some yeah. ways, you know what I mean? Because it is very poetic. Um, but yeah, so I watched that documentary, which was called, um, forget everything you have ever seen the world of Santa Sagre. Um, it was from 2011 making on the making of the film. Um, that's probably my favorite film I've seen of his, um, like El Topo and, um, Holy Mountain. I also really enjoyed, but 
there's something to be said for Santa Sagre because that's the one I watched multiple times where the other ones I've only seen once. Yeah. Um, and I think that was shot probably around in 91 or it was released in 91 around that era. The documentary, I wouldn't say it's like a well-constructed documentary. It's not from somebody who I would say, ooh, any film, they, any documentary that they make, I want to see it because they're good at telling stories. Yeah. It's basically they just interviewed a lot of people involved, including the, you know, the director and just put some interview you know some of the interviews are just they kind of go on and on about maybe some more mundane topics or whatever yeah as a fan of the film if you like the movie definitely check out the documentary it's i think it was on shutter i believe um because it is interesting and you get to hear more of his perspective and i like hearing him talk as well just like watching david lynch talk you know what i mean like okay where are you coming at with this stuff and there's a lot i learned about the film and the perspective on it and decisions being made and stuff like that um uh and yeah, it's yeah, it's a very good watch. I think if you are a fan of the film, but I wouldn't say it's like a stellar documentary if you are not interested in his work at all. But also yeah. too, it spoils some of the film, of course. So watch that first, if yeah. you please. All right, was that it? Yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, right. Great outdoors. I can go into detail about that. <laughs> a John Candy film. Watch that again. That's comfort food, though. <laughs> Right, so we'll move into our discussion of Seven, the 1999 or 1995 film from David Fincher that, of course, had Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, Kevin Spacey, um, Gwyneth Paltrow is in it, uh, Arlie Ernie is in it. Um, i trying to think who else. There's other faces you'll recognize in it. Uh, John, John C. McGinley was in it. Yes, that's who I was going to say. Um, yeah. So he was like on Scrubs. And he's also in The Rock. He played like SWAT team cop military type a lot in the 90s and then was on Scrubs as Dr. Cox. So, And then he's also in that. I don't want to diminish. I don't want to just. Basically, it's like an Ash versus Evil Dead. Or Stan type show. versus Evil Dead. Stan versus versus. Which I've, I've seen some people say they like it more than Ash Evil. versus Evil yeah, Dead. Stan so. versus Evil, right? Or yeah, Stan versus Evil, not Stan versus Evil Dead. <laughs> Stan versus <laughs> That's Evil. Too much like Evil Dead. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So seven. I think everybody at this point have a basic understanding of seven. Is we'll do full spoilers throughout because I'm sure you you've heard of this movie. But and, of all, fi- you've probably actually maybe know the ending too. Even if you haven't seen the film, yeah. So if you but if also you, watch the film because I think this is one of the, probably the best endings of the '90s. Yeah. So watch the movie. Do not like if you haven't seen it yet. Go watch it first before you listen to this because, like, I think a lot of the movie you have to kind of discuss the ending because that's like it's a movie that too like so like I said if you haven't seen it go watch it because we're gonna go through spoilers, but the overall movie so basically. There's a killer that is killing people. Um, so Morgan Freeman's a detective that's about to retire. Brad Pitt is his his partner for the last week of his career. And somebody starts killing people uh, using the seven deadly sins as inspiration and killing people in ways that represent what he you know personifies to be problems with society through the use of the seven deadly sins. And Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman are investigating and they're trying to find him. And, you know, Morgan Freeman is kind of a more difficult to work with cop. It seems like he doesn't have a lot of support. Um, uh, Somerset and then Brad Pitt's character with Mills. But he so, also like he's on his way out and doesn't want to even take the case because he knows this is something like from the first murder. Yeah. He tells uh, the police chief, which is Arlie Ermey, yeah. like, hey, this is there's going to be more. And he's like, we don't know that. And he's like, no, there's going to be more. I don't want this. Yeah. You know? He knows it's going to yeah, go on. So, I mean, I think he's difficult to work with too, because he's been around the block and he knows how. So he's are good at what he out. does. Yeah. He's not super personable and he's on his way out. So, <laughs> and he wants to be done. And then, you know, Brad Pitt's character Mills is an up and coming detective. wants to prove himself and show that he's, you know, worthy of everything. But he's and, also been around the block. You know, he's also, yeah, he's yeah, not he, fresh face. Yeah, he moved to this town, um, this city, and Morgan Freeman warns him, like, hey, man, this city will chew you up and spit you out. Yeah. Which, for me, I think that's definitely, this whole city is absolutely a character in this film. Yes. This feels like... It's constantly the, raining. The, uh, you know, Gotham City times 10 almost. I mean, this feels like David Fincher made his own version of Gotham. Yeah. That is way more sadistic and R rated. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't, it is it an actual city. Do they call it? An, I mean, they don't call it a name, right? I don't think so. Yeah. Cause it, it feels like a fictional place because it is just so. It's like a worse Chicago kind of yeah, in terms of crime, but with the weather of Seattle amped up. Yeah. And also, you know, 
more S and M flavor to it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, so so it's a grimy film. Like yeah. this is it has a a heavy, thick aesthetic through the entire movie, and such a strong personality that I think also definitely made people aware of Fincher and like who made this film. You know? Yeah, because it's one of those movies that you watch it and you come away feeling gross almost mm-hmm. just because. The things that so in the movie, it's like John, um, uh, John Doe. So the the killer played by Kevin Spacey, like do, you never find out his actual name um, in the movie, and they don't really know who he is, and they just you know so he's called John Doe, and you don't see him till the back half of the movie uh, or towards the end of the movie, really. Like you hear like a voice, or you see like a quick glimpse of him, and the movie is just you know. Haunting is like some of the kills he that that or some of the ways he kills people are very horror film esque, and you know force like somebody to eat till they you know die from overeating. Take somebody that's like a drug dealer and a, a child abuser and tie him to a bed and essentially let him become a living skeleton where they're still alive but barely and their brain is mush and they're just reacting like on pure like sensory reception and just like terrible and then. You know, the knife used on the woman. Yeah, having a woman where he um, straps it on. Oh yeah, where the, the he makes like a custom made sex toy that's like a, yeah. a for better or worse term like a strap on dildo type thing that has a knife where he's for uh, the guy is forced to use it to kill a prostitute. So specifically, the aftermath of that scene, you know, I was thinking like this this the description like. Just the description that this film doesn't have to like show these murders. Yeah, the aftermath is way more horrifying than like anything in the Friday the Thirteenth films. Or yeah, because it doesn't you know I mean? show you them occurring; it shows you the yeah, aftermath. and it's like the the nature and the intent and the the meanness behind a lot of these. Yeah, even though you don't see it. Just the descriptions is way more effective than a lot of on screen kills in films. Yeah. you know what I mean. And that's the kind of thing about this film that also makes it feel more grimy. And out of all the Fincher films, I know a lot of people think like, oh, this is a lot of people say like this is my favorite Fincher film or whatever. Yeah. Um, for me, it's hasn't been my favorite, but also I haven't watched it as much because oddly enough, this is so grimy. I yeah. don't revisit this one. Like I would rather watch Zodiac again well, and again because it's, it's almost more of a fun film, even though that's based on a real life event. Yeah. Like you know, the characters are more fun. It's not as dour. Like this is a depressing film in all angles. Well, you have, I think that the, the deaths are more impactful because as you said on screen, you see the end result. You don't see the, what actually happens. So with your mind, when your mind fills in the blank, what Mm -hmm. happened, then it's worse than anything they could put, they could have put on screen and is worse than something in a movie that's intended to have like gross out kills. Yeah. Because you prosthetics and all that stuff and CGI even in that era, 95 CGI wasn't very good. So at that era, like the prosthetics and everything, it would have not looked, like I said, the the, the effects they could have possibly put on screen to show it happen would have been nothing compared to what your mind conjures up when you see the end result. Yeah. Or how would you shoot that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, can, you know how you shoot it and it, it would be very disturbing. Honestly, his the scene that's also very hard to watch of his is uh, from Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Yeah. Um, where she goes in to the guy who was coercing her, you know, and that is a hard, like my wife does not like watching that scene. Yeah. She wants to skip past it. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty like David Fincher knows how to, you know, turn the knobs I well, think, and, on the audience for sure. And like double talking about movies that are double bills. Cause then we mentioned before eight millimeter, or maybe we didn't, it was just connected to something we discussed. It was the writer. Of this, I think wrote eight. Millimeter. Okay, yes, yeah. The writer of seven also wrote eight millimeter, and stylistically, that movie has a similar grime mm-hmm. to it. And I was like, those two movies make like a double bill that you could watch and then just go take a shower yeah. after. And you know, Nicolas Cage when he was in good Nicolas Cage mode when he was still you know putting in good work, and but seven like you know with Mills and um and I'm always confusing just the the detectives names and everybody's names. Um, with Somerset and Mills, like the dynamic between them, it is nice because you see it like evolve and you mm-hmm. see, um, you know, them kind of warm up to each other. And a lot of it's because of Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, character, Tracy, kind of pushing, like inviting Somerset over for dinner and then being personable to and, him. And that's another thing about, you know, being impactful is that. 
the end of the film is so impactful because, you know, something like Lethal Weapon, we start out and um, Mel Gibson's wife is dead, you know, yeah. so it's like, okay, he's dealing with this. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's character is not just a character that you see maybe for 20 minutes and then dies. Yeah. And it's a catalyst. You, this is one of the main characters that we grow with and we don't, yeah. we don't expect, we expect her to be, you know, the, the, the issues at home yeah. and kind of the side, the B story with this. And, you know, they're going to have a kid and all this stuff. You expect her to not come into the fold at yeah. all based on the way the story's set up. Yeah. You just think this is a B plot thing and the, yeah, they really set up the T on this film well, and- for this ending. And the element, like, you see, like, Brad Pitt just laying in bed next to her, mm-hmm. um, or Mills and her just laying in bed. So you see, like, these just moments that are normal couples moments. Yeah. And so then it builds that up. So you have all these gruesome murders going, going on that they're investigating. And and then once you realize that then it becomes to they're a part of it, not just observing it. Yeah. Then that, you know, kind of shifts the view and then makes you as a viewer... Because, you know, regardless of what you think of Gwyneth Paltrow's, like, cookbooks and <laughs> overpriced lifestyle products today, mm-hmm. like, she gave a great performance in this mm-hmm. of just kind of, like, the kind, nice, you know, person that's a good person that's just struggling to deal with, like, this kind of gross, grimy city and being pregnant in an area where she has no friends aside from her husband, mm-hmm. which is why she reaches out to his partner, Somerset, just to talk to somebody that's, you know, not him because of, you know... I guess like her family's probably far away and all of her friends are away. So it's just one of those things where you, you and she sympath- also asked about the city, you know, she, yeah. she's like wanting some talk to somebody who also has experience with the city because it's a di- issue she has to deal with now. So it's one of those things where you just grow to be super sympathetic to the characters. And even though, you know, Mills is kind of a hothead and, and all that, he's still like on the good side. Mm-hmm. He's just, you know, hothead enthusiastic on the right side of the wall. Um, I mean, aside from where they kick in the door at John Doe's and house. That, and that leads you to basically set up the ending to be believable that he would take that action yeah. of shooting him because you had already saw before like him being like... He's willing to bend the rules a little bit. He, yeah, he had it then after just getting shot or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like He was like, no, oh well. Even when he was calmed down a little bit, you yeah. know, he was like, nope, this is I made a decision. So that sets you up for the end. Like, okay, you know he is going to make some irrational decisions at times. Yeah. And his buttons are, can be pushed. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and two, something I was rewatching this movie, um, knowing Kevin Spacey's role in it and who Kevin Spacey is, because in 95 he wasn't super well known. Because when did... um. Probably like 97 or when 99. Usual Suspects. Oh, out? yeah. Because I think Usual Suspects was his real. So that was 95. So same year. And then 99 was, um, was it 99 American Beauty? Yeah, it's American Beauty. So, like he became a big star at a certain point. But in this movie, if you watched it without really realizing who he was at the time, when he shows up early in the movie as the attempt to like to appear as a journalist or a photographer, yeah. then, you know, and when you first saw the movie, it's a throwaway moment. But rewatching it, knowing who he is or hearing his voice, you're like, oh, it's Kevin Spacey. Yeah, people now will be like, we'll be able to pick him out. Because at this point, you'll be able to watch the movie and recognize someone in Kevin Sta- uh, Spacey's stature is not going to be a minor character for the most part. Jeff Goldblum and the Sentinel. Sentinel. <laughs> yeah, but that was also like 20 years before Jeff yeah. Goldblum became Goldblum. Yeah. But the, yeah, so when you see... Um, also a photographer. <laughs> yeah. So when you see... Kevin Spacey show up, then you like when you rewatch the movie, you kind of it's a little bit different watch. But then like when Kevin Spacey when they when they find his um apartment and you know, then there's the chase that goes on where Mills almost catches him and then almost gets killed, but he decides not to kill him at the time. Like all of that is pretty thrilling. Yeah, I mean it's like so many things are well handled in this film and especially you can appreciate on rewatches because you know how things are going to play out and it still evokes a reaction. Yeah. And even the end, like I, you know, that scene is parried and gifts go around and yeah. What's I, in the box? I think about it a lot, but then it's been a while since I've seen the film and I've seen it a handful of times, but I was trying to think like, what's the best way? Like I know the end result, but I was trying to think like from a writer's perspective or directing, like what's the best, most impactful way to make this last scene hit so hard. Like, yeah. In what order do you dole out, dole out the information 
for the characters, the audience, you know, yeah. and it is handled so well. Like I can't think of a better way to execute that well, final and, scene. And two, by not even showing you what's in the box, just having uh, yeah. If you saw a prosthetic head, it'd be like eh. yeah, I mean, like, yeah, or like CGI yeah. or some photography but trick. There's been so much other good, grimy. Yeah, and you don't stuff. need to see it. Not seeing it makes it worse. Yeah. Um, and then you see Somerset's reaction to it. You see John Doe's like, my plan is coming to fruition and I'm mm-hmm. now going to be, you know, made immortal and everyone's going to realize what I did here. So you see all that stuff kind of click into place. And he also doles out the information to Brad Pitt's character like, hey, oh, yeah, she was pregnant. And he's like, oh, you didn't know. Like it just yeah. everything comes to a head perfectly in a very well stacked order yeah. to build up to the you know conclusion or whatever it's yeah so well constructed and like this film is built by a masterful architect and yeah. executed it you know masterfully as well like it's yeah. so well done well and too apparently like the original script had the head in the box ending and then they the studio didn't like that because that was too far so they rewrote it and had it changed and then the version they sent to Fincher had the original ending. Yeah, and they said, oh, no, it's wrong. <laughs> and then he was like, no, I want this. And then he got like Brad Pitt to go to bat for it, yeah. too. And then they kept it in and made it. And then, of course, it became one of the more impactful endings to a movie, you know, in that era. We didn't talk about this movie already in the podcast, did we? What? Seven? I don't think so. Okay. Or maybe we just, maybe one of us just talked about it or something where we we've, watched it. I'm possibly. sure we've mentioned it. Yeah, a, maybe I time. just watched it and said what I've been watching. Because, yeah, like, I don't yeah. remember watching it, like, because I've seen bits and pieces of it on, like, TV yeah. and stuff like that. But, to, like, sit down and rewatch it from beginning to end, it's been quite a while. Yeah. And it's one of those things, too, where when the movie came out in the 90s, so I'm trying to remember when I saw it first, like, maybe in the 90s, early 2000s, because in 95, I would have been 10. Mm-hmm. It was a bit, a bit mature for a 10-year-old. Yeah. It was, like, probably a few years later. And watching it then, like, it's just like, oh, this character that I like, that happens... But, like, once you're an adult and you have a significant other, then you're like, oh, shit, like, if that happened to me, like, what would the reaction be? Yeah. That'd be, like, unbelievable, and that would be so, like, terrible. So I think that resonates, like, resonates just because you like the characters, and then it resonates even more if you, like, put yourself in those shoes. Mm-hmm. And it's just, like, this, like, smug, you know, ass killer is sitting here right in front of you kind of taunting you about it. And, yeah, so just, it's a master, like, the story itself is very engaging and then the ending just turns it from being like a solid genre like cop movie into something more and it makes it something that's really impactful and everybody still like if you were to walk up to somebody and say what's in the box they probably have heard that yeah they've never heard of the movie so it's one of those things where great storytelling stylistically they got the exact right look for it you know, the city becomes its own character. They make you f- have more visceral reaction by not showing you things. Mm-hmm. And then the things they do show you are incredibly well done. And then like the model or the attractive woman where they, he mutilates her face and then she can either call nine one one to be saved, but to be de- deformed for the rest of her life or disfigured, or she can just take a bunch of sleeping pills and die. And she chooses just to die. So in that case, like, it's not clear, like, well, why was she? She's not necessarily a terrible person per se, just very well, I guess vain. it was she had to make the decision. Is she vain? Yeah. Vain enough to kill herself? You know what I mean? I think yeah. that was the decision. Just like he kind of left the decision of rage up to Brad Pitt's character. Yeah. Mills, he, you know, said he 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 assumed rage would get the best of him and he would yeah, make wrath. his point. Or wrath, yeah. He would make his point, which is that is what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also love his description of... When they're reading the journals, like, oh, yeah, this is the banality. He's just so bored of existence. Yeah. And then he throws up on the one guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just, there's so many small touches that I love uh, to the entire film. And like I said, the city. But it also is like, yeah, not a city you want to live in. So it's maybe yeah. not a film you want to live with all the time as well because it is just so grimy. And this is also, too, it seems like it was starting to creep in his him and Trent Reznor's their BFF relationship, yeah. you know, because we just straight up nine inch nails song, uh, in this film. Yeah. in the opening part. Yeah. And then in the sex shop as well. So it's one of those um, things too. Like, yeah, the, um, if somebody told me it's their favorite movie, like, Oh, my favorite movie in the world is seven. I watch it all the time. Like once a week. 
Yeah. I'd be like, well, have you killed anyone? <laughs> because like masterful movie, um, like you said, it's not one that I want to sit down and watch for casual viewing. Yeah. Because something like The Thing or Evil Dead 2, like I'll just throw on sometimes when I'm doing mm-hmm. stuff because I've seen them enough that I enjoy the beats and whatever part I'm kind of catching I enjoy. But I've seen it so much, it's just kind of background noise that sometimes like, yeah. like I'm just sitting there doing something. Or otherwise, I do like TV shows. Yeah. I've seen a and bunch. Like, or Zodiac is like, even though it's based on real murders, yeah, that is just an easier film to swallow. Because well, Zodiac, I mean, which is the, the intent of Seven. You know, that was the intent of that. Film like Zodiac had yelled. some, you know, rough stuff in it too. Mm-hmm. But he was killing people by shooting them in the head mm-hmm. or stabbing them in the back. That's a little bit different than strapping a bladed strap onto someone and forcing them at gunpoint to have sex with someone with this knife. It's mm-hmm. just like the mental imagery you would conjure for that is just horrific. Yeah. And in the Zodiac stuff too, you have moments of levity and jokes mm-hmm. with like Jake Hall and Robert Downey Jr. So you have some breaks there. In, in the some city things. of San Francisco, yeah. you know, it's, it's not this... Um, it ha- not a city that had to be fictional because it is so oppressive. Grimy. Yeah, and oppressive. Yeah. Well, too, this like, feels like a German death metal band come that th- turn into a city, like well, in the feel of it. Well, something else, like so, the Crow from a yeah. few years earlier kind of had like the a dark city. Like a lot of places had like these kind of grimy cities. The movie Dark City. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. yeah. So they had these kind of grimy, dark areas, but then like, I mean, too, like um, completely unrelated. I bought a DVD a while back. It was like a two a two pack. That was Cloverfield and Dark City. Mm-hmm. It's like, how do you connect those two movies? I don't know. But the visual aesthetic from like Seven appears in other things after that, and it's just the city is almost like it's constantly raining and gross, mm-hmm. and and then too like whatever you think like Morgan Freeman is perfectly cast in this movie. He is like the absolute perfect person for this movie. Because I think they had offered it to other actors who were like, um, like more well known at the time. Like mm-hmm. I think like S- Sylvester Stallone was offered it maybe, and some like different yeah, I think actors I might have saw something on that. Um, I was gonna watch the, I watched it on Netflix, and then I was like, oh wait, I've got the DVD. Let me watch some of the special features. Yeah, but it doesn't really have like vignettes. It has the commentaries, like multiple ones, which I want to listen to, and I didn't get a chance to, but. Yeah, I didn't. There was not like a big making of feature at which I would love to see on this and to hear a lot of the back behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the city is just. Oh, uh, Denzel Washington also turned okay. down. Okay. Yeah. And which, then I think Denzel later said that that was like a regret. But like Morgan Freeman is perfect in this movie. Yeah. So I would, I you know, like you talk about dream casting sometimes and how things could have went differently. This is one I would not want them to have changed it. Mm-hmm. And Brad Pitt was perfect as a kind of hot headed young partner. Like you said, not inexperienced. He had been on the, you know, be a, mm-hmm. been a beat cop and become a detective. But he was much younger and new to the city. Like yeah. he did not have the same footing as. So he had know. not been as um, uh, torn down and mm-hmm. and wor- uh, world wary as Somerset was. So, so like I think it was good casting. And then Gwyneth Paltrow was good casting as well because she played the characters like very sweet and likable and relatable. And it just makes the ending all that much more devastating. And then Fincher picked up on how creepy Kevin Spacey actually is. So yeah. it came off on camera twice as good, which I'm also just because of all that how stuff. How creepy he allegedly I'm is. I'm glad that he like just occupies the back half of the film. too. You know what I mean? It makes it easier to watch unless instead of him being out all throughout. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, and two, like his character is meant to be yeah. this terrible um, killer and he played the part very well. So. And, and two, there's an element that makes you wonder, like, so with all these allegations going on with different people being called out for their terrible behavior in the past, um, you know, some of them having pretty huge consequences of their career, some pushing it aside is more of just like, well, that's, you know, because there's some accusations that seem pretty well founded based on how many other people have had mm-hmm. similar stories. And there are some accusations of people that have been kind of like one offs that mm-hmm. they kind of brush off and doesn't get any traction. So... You know, it's one of those things where everybody, my, my entire point of that was not to seg into that too much. It's just like how you view work of people once you know things mm-hmm. about them. And with that movie seven, even if Kevin Spacey is a worse monster than has been alleged in the media, mm-hmm. the things that, you know, he's, that doesn't make that character, that just makes the character creepier. Yeah. And that makes yeah. it, it doesn't make it where, um, 
you have like your bright eye, you know, hero character running that around. You can't believe people. anymore. Yeah. So that character to me, like, you know, even in the abstract, if, you know, it came out that Kevin Spacey had killed someone or if there's a movie like this and a role like mm-hmm. this and they somebody had killed somebody that makes it more disturbing to watch, mm-hmm. but it doesn't really ruin the effect of the movie. And and that movie is not really like celebrating him as a person. No. And, yeah. And, and two, like something else about the movie that I was reading a lot of reviews after the fact, because I was just watching because I've seen it a number of times. It's just been a while since I watched him bringing it in. And I was like, so after the movie ends, like they Arlie Ernie, like the captain or whatever's talking to Somerset and he says, like, we'll take care of him. And he's like Morgan Freeman's character. Somerset says, well, whatever you need or whatever he needs, I'll be around. But just so it's not super clear what's actually going to happen is like so I just read like people's theories on it. Like, what do you think is going to happen to Mills? Do you think he goes to prison? Do you think he gets acquitted? Like, what do you think? Do they cover it up? Like, because the SWAT team was the one watching it. So it's really just a limited like the SWAT team in the mm-hmm. helicopter. But they did say he shot him over the radio. So you just do wonder like what would happen to that cop after that after that event. Because in the real world, people have killed people for not much and not gotten many consequences. Yeah, especially, you know, they never allude to the police force from what I remember being corrupt too much. But yeah, like in that city, you would think (laughs) with the way that city is, you would think there was definitely some corruption that ran through there. I mean, and not to say that's good, not to say you should say, hey, he should get off because, you know. Despite what Kevin Spacey did, he killed an unarmed man that should have, you know. Ulti- been ran through the arms of justice. Well, ultimately, I think that, like I said, you know, it's a fictional movie, and the point wasn't what really happens because Brad yeah. his character Mills's life is, you know, ruined because his wife, who was pregnant, was murdered in a vicious, disgusting way, and so his life is forever, you know, catastrophically changed, and, and you know, probably ruined, probably won't bounce back from that because that'd be a tough thing to ever really recover from. So. A much darker lethal weapon comes out of this. <laughs> so then the the ultimate result was that John Doe succeeded. He got yeah, what he yeah. wanted. He killed out of envy and he was killed due to wrath. Mm-hmm. So he completed the seven deadly sins and So the film's message is that people are sinners and but not but it is also like maybe they shouldn't be punished for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, like the is, movie isn't to side with him. It's yes, just that yeah. he won yeah. via what he planned to do. Now, after the fact, with Brad Pitt's character Mills, like a lot of juries probably wouldn't want to convict someone. Jury, you know, jury nullification. It's like, oh, this is a serial killer who killed multiple people, cut a guy. You know, he said he tried to play daddy or play dad or whatever. So does that imply that he sexually assaulted his wife? Like Mm -hmm. it's pretty implied. So if somebody is a serial killer that's already killed, you know, at that time they're aware of what five people. They're aware that he had killed five or if he didn't directly kill them, cause the directly cause the death of five people. And then he then like assaults and murders and beheads someone's wife, has it put in a box and shipped to them while taunting them. I think the temporary insanity plea would probably work and or the jury would say we're not sending this guy to prison. He's probably never going to be a cop again. But th- like I said, that all that whole th- thread of thinking is beyond the point yeah, of yeah. John Doe one, yeah, and ruined this guy's life. Yeah, they didn't go in ten minutes after you know ten minutes after that point to show you here's what happens because it's not relevant. And, and out of the movie, so you know Tracy dying, Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow's character, she was innocent, hadn't done anything, so that was like the first person as part of his. Um, you know, seven deadly sins killings that really wasn't guilty of any of the mm-hmm. sins. It was him who was guilty of it. Um, or he killed her out of envy, but she herself hadn't really done anything. So that was like the moment. And then, you know, Brad Pitt killing his character, you know, Mills killing his character, killing John Doe. Like that was the logical place for it to go. Cause I don't really know what else, like somebody's reaction would be in that scenario and just like beating them to death. But, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a downbeat ending that can be really affecting for a lot of people. Yeah, like I said, I think it's definitely one of the best endings of the 90s. I would have, like, you know, at the, at the time I was 10, but, like, if you can go back in time, I would, like, see a, a fresh crowd watching the movie with no idea of how oh it Oh, my gosh, ended. yeah. And you would probably have, like, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody, like, barfed. 
or yeah, definitely people gasping or like people moments, being yeah. like just audibly, you know, visibly shaken. Yeah. I would be interested to see what that reaction was because even watching it now when you know it's coming, you're still dreading it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a super effective movie. Um, and then, you know, because Brad Pitt or not Brad Pitt, David Fincher after this, you know, he's operated in the mode of like crime thriller with like Zodiac. Um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is also one. Um, uh, what was the other one? You have other movies. I mean, he did Mindhunter produce that. Yeah, he produced Mindhunter. Directed, so he's he's produced directed some episodes. He, he's been involved with stuff like that since then. There's that movie like The Game and, and other oh, things yeah. that. The Panic Room. I need to revisit that because I watched that once in high school. Yeah. Probably when it was about brand new. Yeah. Uh, I think Joey Roby had it on DVD yeah. or something. <laughs> and he's like, oh, check this. And we watched it over his house one day. I need to rewatch that because I think every other Fincher movie except for Benjamin Button. Yeah. I have seen, you know, within the past decade. Because like Zodiac is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. That movie um, is very, very good. But like other thematic movies that you could put this with as a double bill would be Silence of the Lambs because mm-hmm. the kind of FBI yeah. murder investigation was kind of really in vogue in the 90s because you had Twin Peaks, X-Files, Silence of the Lambs, Seven, you know, it was detectives that weren't FBI, but you had a lot of those things coming into popular culture at that time. So that movie like shot, you know, beautifully or disgustingly mm-hmm. and appropriately and, you know, perfect performances from everybody. And a lot of like, I think I read that Fincher wanted the movie to be shot more like cops, like more simple um, cinematography. And like when they're driving in the car, like shoot it more like light and nimble and not mm-hmm. as many. It's not as stylized with like crane shots everywhere. Yeah. As Steady far as Cam. Fincher's, you know, he almost makes the cameras seem like they float and just, you know, he does very few handheld shots in his films. Now there might yeah. be one or two scenes. Yeah. This is, this is removed from that. Like I think probably what, like was Zodiac, maybe the first one moving into his modern era. And then like, the social network like yeah. hammered at home basically and like solidified like, okay, this is a very distinctive Fincher style. I mean, Zodiac yeah. was as well, but uh, social network was further, I think than that. Yeah. And, and the girl, with the dragon head too. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is early Fincher. So it's, he does have a lot of static shots in this film, even yeah. in some of the action scenes, but he mixes up with a lot of handheld work too at certain points. When it feels more intimate than something mm-hmm. like Zodiac kind of, because yeah. in this movie you're kind of focused in more on the characters you're, you're following Mills and Somerset. And then in Zodiac, like you have more characters it's, filtering it's throughout. It's a bigger picture of how this, how the killer affected yeah. so many people in the city and everything like that. Yeah. So this, I'm sure that movie seven influenced a lot of bands in the nineties mm-hmm. to have a visual aesthetic and fit in perfect with like nine inch nails. I mean, yeah. It feels like it's a tool movie or nine inch nails, yeah. you know, the, well, he directed a video yeah. for like perfect circle mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And nine inch nails, he had involvement with them. And so all that like meshes together from that era, uh, perfectly. So I guess we can kind of give the movie our, um, scores out of 10, um, towards you rank this probably a nine point five. Like I'm, I'm going at least nine. Yeah, because stylistic, like everything about it comes together. It's a movie mm. that I personally, because like when you do horror movies, something that I run into a lot is nothing actually scares me, and that's not saying that I'm big and bad. It's just when you watch enough movies. You don't typically get scared by something popping up yeah. on screen as much. And this it's, is this is a crime thriller, but it is so dark, and you know what yeah. I mean. It's like yeah. So to me, like I don't get scared on screen. I get affected by things that it makes you think about. And this movie does that very well in terms of making you think about things that you know you can sit there and think about what some of those deaths look like leading up to it occurring, and you're like, oh. So that to me is like super effective when it comes to genre movies. And this movie does that better than almost anything I can think mm-hmm. of. And then, you know, like as you said, like it's ex- you know, like perfectly cast, actually directed. So it all works really well. It all comes together great and has an ending that unfortunately you can't watch for the first time again. But it's still having a reaction to it every time you watch it indicates it's very effective. So a movie that I think, you know, is a great example of his filmography. It may not be my favorite movie of his because I think mine is probably Zodiac. But I appreciate this one a lot, and this one elicits a more visceral reaction than anything Mm -hmm. else he's made. So, you know, it is interesting to see, like, he came from Alien 3, which I think on his perspective was, like, a terrible experience of being pushed around and being changed around and all that. 
to then being in this movie and hitting your perfect stride and, you know, getting what was wanted out of it. So you're good for him that he was able to get back into a mode of things he wanted to do and then had the career he's had since then and mm-hmm. made all the things he has. Yeah. So a pretty unanimous thumbs up on that movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's stellar, stellar film. So, it's just not one. Yeah. That's a light watch, even as yeah. light as like you said, Zodiac. I think my favorite Fincher film is the social network. I yeah. love that film. Yeah, I mean, I love so that movie too much. The writing, the acting, everything. But yeah, I really love Zodiac as well. And, and then, this film as well. I love it. It's just, I can put on social network at any time and enjoy yeah. any scene. Well, Zodiac and, is an easy one. And two, about. how much more relevant has the social network become yeah. after all these recent yeah. revelations about like Zuckerberg yeah. going to uh, the Congress or Senate whoever testifies? Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah, so that'll wrap up our discussion of Seven, which is on Netflix and every, I'm assuming, format you could possibly want to buy it mm-hmm. on. But, uh, Maybe not Laserdisc. Yeah, that may Betamax. be out of print. <laughs> but, uh, if you're listening via iTunes, you can leave us a review there. That's a huge help. Helps other people find the podcast. You can always leave us comments or feedback on YouTube and subscribe to us there on as well on Facebook, Instagram, all those platforms. You can find links to everything on housepavillastore.com. Um, and make sure to follow us on Instagram because we do post stuff there. Like the other night we shot like part of a smaller project and I had shared like some images on the Instagram stories of that. Um, and we do try to post things there more often just to, to get images out there because Instagram is probably the most um, positive social interaction you have on social media, I think, because it's posting images and people either like it or comment. You don't get as much negative feedback as you do on some other platforms. But uh, so you can follow us there to see stuff. Um, and then we got some shorts in the works, different things we're trying to work out. So make sure to keep up on all of our social media to see what we got going on. And then if you want to follow us specifically on the internet, I'm on Twitter at William Caps. I'm at Blevin Sean. And that will bring this episode of the House by VSR podcast to a close. Thanks for listening.